Sorry Hello. for that. And welcome to another event hosted by the Bipartisan Policy Center. My name is Dane Stengler, Director of Strategic Initiatives at BPC. Today's event is defining competitiveness. We're talking about what competitiveness means, how we define it, how we begin to measure it, and what public policy can and should do about it. We have a great panel discussion for you, but first, we're delighted to have a conversation with Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester. She represents the at-large district of Delaware, which is the entire state. It's the country's oldest congressional district. She serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. She's also the founder of the Future of Work Caucus in the House. We're gonna have an excellent conversation with her about a wide range of issues. Congresswoman, welcome. Thank you so much, Dane, for having me. And a special thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for even creating this kind of forum on such an important issue. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to jump right into it because I know you have a very busy schedule. So we're talking, uh, as I mentioned at the top, about defining this very vague and broad term of competitiveness and what it means for you for the United States. There's these two big bills uh, working their ways through the conference process in Congress. Uh, Yusika coming from the Senate, competes coming on the uh, coming from the House. How how do you approach this issue of competitiveness? What what does it mean to you? How would you define that? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's interesting when I think of competitiveness, um, and I, I think of us in terms of our global competitiveness, how we stand in the world, and that's everything on indicators from our quality of life to our national security to our ability to thrive and have a strong economy. And I really approach it in a very comprehensive way. I mean, some people might look at competitiveness as just, you know, your GDP. But for me, I'm, I'm looking at it um, comprehensively. I, I think about, number one, a strong workforce. Number two, a modern infrastructure. And number three, a robust investment in research and development and innovation, which we are historically known for as a country. And then I think the last thing that I think of in terms of being able to be competitive and strong at this moment is unity. And I think that's a very important component that a lot of people might not factor into it, but I do. Um, having lived and traveled to over 30 countries in the world. My son was born in France, um, so I've experienced healthcare there. Um, my late husband worked in China for a French electrical manufacturing company. And so to me, when I look at competitiveness, I'm looking at where we stand in comparison to the world, but also what we are providing for the folks right here at home so that we have a, a great quality of life. And it starts with education. Like if I could just jump into the things that I think of when I think about it, I think of it from the earliest ages. What is, what is our education system and how is it preparing people for life and for the workforce and meeting the labor market demands? I mentioned infrastructure. To me, you know, you can't be competitive if you've got old roads and bridges and outdated ports. To me, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that we passed and that the president signed into law was transformational. It even created our, our dealing with things like the digital divide. Then innovation, again, one of the great things about this new legislation that we're looking at is that it, again, focuses us as a country on research and development and innovation so that we can be competitive. Because when you look at countries like China, they contribute nearly 2% of their GDP on industrial support in the form of research and development and innovation where we spend less than a half a percent. And so again, it's about that um, competitiveness. It's about a strong workforce. And it's also about making sure that we are coming together for a good quality of life, as well as our national security. Well, you mentioned several points in there that I wanna follow up on. Uh, but before we dig into each of those points, I do wanna ask you about uh, the conference process or, uh, with uh, UCK and Compete. Are there any updates or insights you can give us into that process and what the American public might expect there? 
Yes, you know, well, first of all, um, I, I have to say, um, uh, you know, as far as the process goes, um, this was new to me. This is my first time really serving on a big conference committee this, this large and this expansive. I was fortunate to be on the Agriculture Committee when I came into Congress and worked on the Farm Bill, um, but this is something of a, of a whole different level. And so in terms of, of process, the first thing I would say is that for me personally, there was an awareness that we had challenges because I'm on the health subcommittee. And during the pandemic, we saw a shortage of things like PPE and vials. And, and you know, we started to notice, okay, we've got these dependencies across, you know, across the, across the globe here. Then I noticed that um, visiting businesses, small businesses and large businesses in my state, that things like lumber, they couldn't get their hands on. And so I noticed that, okay, we got supply chain issues here, as well as the issue of chips that are in everything from our cars to our phones. And so I, 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 the first thing for me was awareness. The second thing was gathering data. And that's part of what, what we did even in our team to understand what the issues were. And then next was engagement. We reached out and started having conversations with, um, first of all, the two co-leads that I have on my provisions in the Competes Act, which are focused on uh, supply chains and strengthening our supply chains. And that's Adam Kinzinger, as well as Tom Melanowski, bipartisan, um, but we had to bring others around the table, like folks from the private sector folks from the education sector, and also um, make sure that we had labor at the table. So I even had round tables with labor unions. This was all in preparation just to develop the provisions. We got our provisions into the American Competes Act. And now, as you mentioned, we have what is called a conference committee, where we're trying to bring the bill that the Senate passed with the bill that the House passed together. Um, I actually wrote probably, I don't know, it might have been a 15-page letter. I'm exaggerating, but to the Speaker of the House to see if I could bring my expertise as the former Secretary of Labor in Delaware and, you know, uh, as a person who's lived in different countries and, you know, wanted to bring and as a member of Energy and Commerce to the conference process and I got selected to be on the committee. And since then, um, in addition to, you know, the, the overall big meeting we had where all of the members on the conference committee got to talk about their respective components, um, we've had sessions um, on everything from research and development um, and bipartisan, bicameral, to national security. And what's really important is that it has created this sense of urgency for us. Um, we want to, and I've heard this from Democrats and Republicans, we want to see this legislation move before we get, you know, further into the summer. One of my colleagues even um, said, wouldn't it be a great 4th of July uh, if we were able to pass uh, this legislation? And so um, in terms of the process, it's uh, different individual meetings that are happening, um, collective briefings and meetings that are happening. And at this point, we are at the point now where we're having to get into the nitty gritty of any of the challenges that any of the uh, committees actually have so that we can get this bill across the finish line and signed by President Biden. Thanks, Congressman. The, the process you describe of uh, awareness, uh, digging into the data, and then engagement, it sounds like an ideal process. And I wish, I wish everyone took that approach to the legislation and policymaking. Um, I know our, our advocacy on BPC Action has been uh, publicly supportive of your supply chain provision. So let me, again, take an opportunity to commend you and, and your colleagues for, for, that, uh, for that piece of the, of the legislation. Let me tell you, I got to put a pin in that just to, again. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. We've had over 150 businesses step up and say that they're in support of this, our supply chain provisions. And it's because we know this affects inflation. This affects our, again, all of those different things I talked about. A lot of people think of supply chain as just like one little piece or one little industry. It is everything. It is everything. And so the support uh, coming from, 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 you know, all of the, the folks that are out there, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We just got to get across the finish line now. Well, no, thank you. Um, I want to ask you about uh, workers and, and the workforce and how that plays in here. Because you spend a lot of time thinking uh, about workers, um, about their well-being, and, and how we keep them at the at the leading edge as well. So, 
you talked about, you know, research investments. We hear a lot of talk about quantum computing and artificial intelligence and those kind of next generation fields. I mean, they're very exciting. How, how do we make sure that we're both at the leading edge of technological innovation, but we're also bringing workers along? You know, you also hear, hear you often hear people talk about a trade-off. Well, we're going to automate jobs or we have jobs, you know, this trade-off between technology and jobs. How are you approaching this and make sure, making sure that workers and workforce are right alongside that discussion of the technological areas? Yeah, wow, thank you for that question. I mean, first of all, you hit on my passion, which is uh, jobs and workforce. Um, it goes back, I realized recently that like almost from the very beginning, my first job was McDonald's, but after McDonald's, um, I, my, one of my first jobs was a coordinator for the Summer Youth Employment and Training Program. And then I went into working with individuals on welfare. And, you know, and then I became Secretary of Labor and Head of State Personnel in Delaware. And currently, as you mentioned, uh, myself and Brian Style co-chair the Bipartisan Future of Work Caucus. And we started that caucus. I, I, I had that, that vision because I was hearing about the fears and concerns about automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Number one, I was hearing about the fears of people being left behind. And then also, I knew that other countries, uh, I remember reading that China said they would match us in, in, in uh, I think it was in, in AI by 2025 and surpass us by 2030. Again, circling back to America competes. And I, you know, the whole thing was, how do we prepare people? How do we leverage this moment? And how do we not be scared? And how do we lean into it? And how do we do it as a country? not, you know, divided. And so part of, to me, the, the big thing to think about is just the, the sheer dem dem demographic changes that we have. I mean, we got an aging population. We've got diversity. We've got, you know, folks that um, have been, uh, I, I would say, victims to the digital divide. And so in this moment, to me, part of it is kind of going back again to the innovation and creativity is looking at ways that we can be creative and innovative. I, I was just with um, the head, the former head of uh, Comores, uh, Mark Vergnano. He has started a new thing, an uh, organization called FOSSI, which is the Future of STEM Scholars Initiative. And their whole goal is to work with HBCUs, historical black colleges and universities across the country to get to build that pipeline and get folks not only to get the, the scholarships to go to school, but also to get the internships and the mentoring to get into these fields that we're talking about. I think we also do it by making sure that people have access to the internet and have access to opportunities. Um, but I also think that we have to think about um, the fact that, you know, I was actually over 50 when I decided to run for Congress. Like I started a whole new profession having not run for anything in my life. And so creating these opportunities for lifelong learning, not just higher education, but even short-term certifications and Pell Grants and things like that, so that we can more quickly and nimbly get people trained, upskilled, reskilled. Now's the time to do it. Uh, the pandemic, I think, showed us a lot. And one of the, we, some called it a she session where we had so many women leave the workforce. Some called it the great resignation or the great reassessment where people are reassessing what they wanna do and how they wanna do it. It is a time for us to be listening, to, to, to be responsive. And then for us in Congress to follow up on things like, you know, we underfund things like the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We underfund, um, you know, some of these things that could provide the support to the private sector to get people ready to work. Apprenticeships, another one of those great areas where we can see some change. Um, I, I, I will say another big issue that I hear about is also uh, immigration our immigration system that's broken. So here in Delaware, we have uh, farmers and we have tech companies and we have chemical companies. All of them say that we've got to fix that, that immigration system. Um, the last thing I would just say on the, the STEM, STEAM, 
you know, and you know, I have to say STEAM because I love the arts and I've got to add the A in there. But there's also a, a, a perception of these jobs uh, that have to has to be changed. Number one, that they're accessible and attainable, and and also like bring sexy back to STEAM, you know, or STEM. You know, so so even to see a movie like the Black Panther and have the main character T'Challa uh, have a sister named Shuri who was actually the superstar in the movie because she was a scientist. You know, young black woman braids scientists. Again, to me, part of this is to make it exciting, to make it, um, to create the opportunities, and then to, to not put people in boxes. I might be, you know, now 60, uh, but I can still contribute. And I think this is that kind of moment where um, the sky's the limit. You see, I'm like really into this because I could really, I, I'm trying to like cut myself off, but I also just think about also back to the fear. You know, we did not, um, when we automated things throughout history, it wasn't necessarily that we lost jobs, we changed the types of jobs. Even the banking industry, when ATMs, everybody was scared there would be no more tellers. No, it gave tellers the opportunity to have more quality interactions. You could go on and on about the fact that what we have now are new and different opportunities. We just got to make sure that we prepare people for them and recognize that um, this can help their quality of life, their safety on the job. There's so many different pros as well. So let's let's keep uh, keep STEM and STEAM sexy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Congresswoman. We'll, we'll make that the tagline for this. Uh, for this event. <laughs> you mentioned so many things in there, which, you know, we don't have time to cover um, most of them. And we could talk all day about these things. I, I just want to ask you two more um, questions. One, exactly as you talked about, you talked about the disproportionate effect of the pandemic, um, the she session, the great resignation. We've seen it in other ways, too. You talked about uh, better support for HBCUs. Then you talked about things like, um, you know, in the Black Panther, excellent movie, agree. You know, the importance of that type, type of role model um, uh, role. The, you know, closing disparities for communities of color has been a consistent theme of your uh, career. How, you know, where else do you think that you and your colleagues in Congress should put energy in closing those disparities, especially in the context of competitiveness? Mm, it's, it's such a good question. And I think, you know, I'm going to answer that by saying, I don't think it's just me and my colleagues in Congress, but I think it's all of us. Um, you know, I, I look back at um, this past two years, three years, and the pandemic has shown us things about structural and institutional challenges that we have as a country, why we see health disparities. It's not because, and it, it's not the creation of one program that's gonna solve it. It's going back and looking at our structures. And that's true within companies and corporations. Like it's not enough to say, oh, I can't find people. We'll do something about it. It's the same for us. It, it, you know, if, 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 when we look at how we invest, um, are we putting the investments in the right place? Um, when we look at things like, um, you know, uh, opportunities to break down barriers, this is, this is an awakening moment. And I'm glad to hear um, many of the companies just this past weekend, uh, this past week and this morning even that I was talking to, they, they still um, understand that and, and uh, even on the heels of uh, as Juneteenth is approaching, that there's now a new consciousness that it is better for all of us, both from moving the needle on how we produce products, um, for something like even tech issues, you know, algorithms, it makes a difference. Uh, if something is facial recognition and the person behind it that's designing the code doesn't understand that, it has an impact both on what we produce it has an impact on our economy. It helps the bottom line when people are thinking this way. And I think the, you know, what I would say is uh, back years ago, um, I had to investigate the state police for racial and sexual discrimination. And I remember I had to, I kind of thought of it as four A's 
that um, stood out for me. One was awareness. We have to be aware that we have a problem, that we have challenges, that there are things that if we do differently, we can move the needle in a positive direction. So one is awareness. I think when George Floyd died, I think for some people, maybe they weren't aware, you know, that these things were happening in our communities throughout the country. The second is acknowledging it. If you don't acknowledge it or say it out loud, then nothing, nothing happens. And the other piece to that is when you do acknowledge it, whether you're a company or whether you're an elected official or whatever, you know, you've got to, you've got to then act. So it's awareness, acknowledge, action. There's got to be action. And last is accountability. And, 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 and we will know that things are better because we will see needles move. We will see needles move on disparities. We will see needles move on poverty. We will see needles move on productivity. We will see needles move on our quality of life and how we operate and um, love each other. Congresswoman, um, final question for you. Let's uh, go back to the UC Can Competes conference process. Let's be optimistic and assume yeah. that you and your colleagues got a conference report. You know, you're involved, so the you know, probabilities are high. Um, what, like, okay, let's say a bill passes, like, do we, do we just say mission accomplished? Like, what happens next? What are, what are you looking at in terms of, no, we need to continue to work on these areas for competitiveness, opportunity, and prosperity, even if and when this bill passes? Wow, I, I, you know what, I love that question um, because I think that that's the significance of this moment that there is uh, mission accomplished should not be the word. It will be mission accomplished, mission accomplished, mission accomplished. And what I hope out of this, um, of course, I hope my, my uh, bipartisan supply chain provisions stay in the package, uh, number one, because I do believe it will have an impact on our economy and on inflation, and also the ability for us to, to, to the extent that we can, make things here at home. I, I think that's important. Um, but, but ultimately, what I, I hope um, comes out of this is that we have a, a stronger economy, a more healthy uh, citizenry, uh, national security, and also an opportunity for us to be in it all together. Because we are, um, like uh, King, Martin Luther King said, we may have come over on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So we need to make sure that we're all rowing together and that mission is not accomplished until all of us are safely in the boat. Congresswoman, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your excellent thoughts and your insights. And we look forward to continuing to work with you and your office. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you to Congresswoman Blunt Rochester for that excellent conversation. Now I have the good fortune of turning to what is sure to be a terrific uh, discussion with two uh, outstanding folks in the world of public policy uh, and research. I'd like to welcome uh, first Liz Reynolds. Liz is currently Special Assistant to the President for Manufacturing and Economic Development at the National Economic Council. Liz has also been Executive Director of the Industrial Performance Center at MIT, and also chaired MIT's Task Force on the Work of the Future, uh, which produced a report and a book and which we'll talk about. I'm also delighted to welcome Trent Reasons. Trent is currently a partner at EY Parthenon. Uh, Trent has also held positions at Boston Consulting Group and also served for several years in the Treasury Department as Director of Analysis. Trent, I hope I get that right. You both have very illustrious uh, uh, resumes for me, to, for me to cover. Before we jump in uh, to, to Trent and Liz, I wanna remind our audience that you can submit questions for our panelists using the live chat function on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag BPC Live. Trent and Liz, uh, I wanna kick off first by talking about our issue of defining competitiveness. There's a lot that Congresswoman Blunt Rochester mentioned that I definitely wanna ask you about, but let's start with just this headline topic. You know, this, this word competitiveness is it's very broad. It's almost to the point of what, what does it not include? So I want to ask each of you, you know, what to you uh, really defines competitiveness? Liz, I'll turn to you first. Well, thank you, Dane. It's great to be here. Thank you to the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting this, uh, this panel. And also always a pleasure to um, hear uh, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, who's really a national leader 
on this topic. And um, so competitiveness, I agree, it's got um, a lot of a lot of pieces to the uh, to the definition. I think the classic definition, obviously, is about what are the factors, the institutions, the policies that help uh, drive uh, productivity of a country, uh, which in turn drives prosperity. I think importantly, it's important that we define the context for driving prosperity. It's not just prosperity for prosperity's sake, right? It's trying to make sure that the context for, for competitiveness is reflecting societal values. So it needs to reflect our concerns about uh, labor standards, about sustainability, about inclusive growth. So really I see competitiveness as uh, all of the factors that are going to help us drive productivity, drive prosperity, or make sure that prosperity is shared in a way that reflects our, our values. I think Representative um, Blunt Rochester was talking about global competitiveness, <clears throat> which is of course one way that we measure ourselves relative to other countries. Um, but we understand of course, that that competi global competitiveness is built on uh, the foundations, the micro foundations of competitiveness. That's at the firm level and that's at the regional level. And so that is where we see the importance of uh, labor markets and workforce training and infrastructure and all of those pieces. So I think it's both a top down and bottom up understanding of competitiveness and ensuring that the definition is uh, reflective of uh, societal values. Well, I definitely want to ask uh, you both about that your point, Liz, about the micro foundations of competitiveness as well. So we'll uh, certainly get to that. Trent, how about you? I, help us think through, how, how are you thinking about defining this nebulous term of competitiveness? Thanks, Dane, and, and great to be here. I, I, I think that looking back at, you mentioned about me being the director of analysis of treasury, one of the things I was mandated with was looking at financial stability and what are the components of financial stability. And that was also a, a fairly amorphous term around, is that an absence of crises? Is it resilience? And I think similarly here, um, there's a real need to quantify or at least create some objective measures about what competitiveness means. That's important for policy and for our federal government in terms of looking at where investments should be made, where resources should be allocated, um, where there should be more direction from our, uh, from our leadership. Um, and so we think about it uh, along three different dimensions. One is global market leadership. Um, the second is around business leadership. And the third is, is innovation leadership. There's a real impetus here in terms of looking at, and I know um, um, Representative as well as Liz mentioned these as well, so I don't want to be too redundant, but it's important to emphasize uh, these different aspects of what we can actually see and put our hands around. I think that when we um, start to talk about different components and attributes of what competitiveness means, I think we all kind of know a little bit about what drives uh, the, the United States to be competitive, but it's really important that we understand the relative measures, not just absolute, about how we compare to other countries, to other regions, um, to better understand our positioning and how we can plan for the future. Thanks, Trent. Um, I want to get into the nitty gritty here in terms of you know what's happening today, how you both are seeing it, what you're working on, but I just want to pose one more um, you know kind of a philosophical question, if you will. Um, Trent, as you've noted, and as, as we know from your background, you and your team spend a lot of time helping the public sector think through this and other issues. So, you know, help us transition here from, okay, competitiveness includes productivity and innovation and, um, and leadership, as you talked about, market and business leadership. In terms of actual execution on a strategy, on actions and plans, you know, if you were advising Liz, how, how do you help someone like Liz think through prioritization and a strategy given everything that competitiveness includes. Sure. So, so a, lot of, a lot of what we need to emphasize here is that not all industries are the same. And so applying a competitiveness measurement framework and analysis, one size fits all is not really going to work across industry, across sector, and even across the, the, the labor force. So a lot of what the analysis that we perform is centered around bringing industry expertise and insight into those segments, whether it's technology, whether it's supercomputing, whether it's um, uh, biochemical um, or, or, or health and human services activities and development of new pharmaceuticals. There's, there's a lot of this that has to be layered in that's industry specific about what types of R&D expenditures there are. Um, you know, what, are we, what are we looking at in terms of patent citations and development there? 
new incorporations and spin outs? Uh, what are the types of employment potential that an industry can have? How does that align to different labor market uh, current status as well as potential investments within labor? Um, so it's looking across a whole rubric of metrics to be able to come to an alignment of here's a prioritization framework. It's not meant to be the, 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 the rifle shot of, you know, we've, we've been able to, to measure with an exactitude um, the 3.42% that needs to be aligned to an industry, but it's meant to be an exercise that's a prioritization exercise around objective data. That way, uh, policymakers, uh, federal agency leaders, and others can, can do a little bit of the bigger than a bread box sizing in terms of where the biggest bang for buck is, because there's a lot of discussion going on about uh, the need for investment and the need for focus uh, uh, on different aspects of, comp of competition and how to make the U.S. more competitive. But um, as, as an economist, <laughs> you know, there's, there's rationing, right? Scarcity is an issue. Um, you have to align resources to where they're needed most. Your, your point about, you know, in this being specific about industries is, is really important. And that's something I want to ask Liz about in a second, given her, uh, the research that she's done. Liz, similar question to you, although I don't need to pose the hypothetical, you are advising the president. So how are you and your colleagues helping when, when you can do everything, you know, when the president and Congress have made competitiveness a priority, how do you help think through strategy and prioritization there? Um, well, first of all, let me just say I appreciate Trent's approach to this. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's technically speaking in, you know, countries aren't competing directly. It's our firms uh, that are competing. And so uh, that's where we drive our prosperity. Uh, that's where we drive our opportunity. So it's the right lens to approach to it. But of course, one vertical looking, you know, looking into, you know, the biopharma industry does not reflect the, the whole, uh, we have to understand the horizontals that affect that competitiveness. And so I think that's in some ways where we, um, you know, the, the issues basically surface from a, a series of um, investigations into the verticals, you see the horizontals and understand, okay, what are the issues that actually we can affect across the board? Because that is, of course, the, the role of the federal government is, is in some ways to provide that, that framework on the national side of competitiveness uh, and then help encourage and align with what we're doing at the state and regional level. Um, so from, from, you know, from the get-go, I think the uh, Biden administration came in with a very clear sense of some of the priorities around competitiveness. And, um, and these were, uh, they involve uh, investment, uh, as we heard earlier, you know, the bipartisan infrastructure law, absolutely critical to our competitiveness, helping businesses and, uh, and workers uh, uh, we've seen investment in human capital, whether that's STEM education, whether that's apprenticeships, another critical piece is our education um, cross-cutting, and then the R&D piece. And this is um, you know, really important as part of the Bipartisan Innovation Act. That is uh, a central part of the Biden-Harris uh, Biden administration. There's also structural reforms, again, uh, making sure that we have competitive markets, um, making sure we have a fair global tax system, uh, some of the ways in which we uh, use procurement, all of those priorities that have helped uh, improve competitiveness. Um, and then I think there's also a, an agenda here that has been very much about, when we talk about micro foundations, you're building specialization. How do we become experts and leaders in you know, all of these industries that we see at the frontier? You do it through regional spe specialization. It's the whole cluster theory. Uh, so building that and supporting the investment in regional specialization has also been a priority. So you've seen that, again, Bipartisan Innovation Act, regional uh, te technology hubs, some of what the EDA is doing on Build Back Better grants, uh, ways in which we can expand um, and bring uh, some of that competitiveness to every corner of the country and to communities and to places that have uh, not necessarily participated uh, in the recent growth of, of the country. Thanks, Liz. It's always a hazard to sum up key points while we're in the midst of a discussion, but I, I definitely want to underscore for our audience what Trent and Liz are saying about, you know, when we talk about country competitiveness, we're really talking about the firms. And then Liz has reminded us that in, in addition to that, that verticality, that specialization at the industry level and the geographic level, as Trent has underlined, are the horizontals across things and how do we ensure that um, we have the, the inputs feeding into those. I just want to stop and highlight that point that you both are, are making. 
Um, I want to ask you both about supply chains. This is something that Congresswoman Blunt Rochester talked a lot about in her remarks and something she has spent a lot of time on was I know the president and the administration are very focused on it. Um, there's uh, uh, some provisions in the Bipartisan uh, Innovation Act that are pertain to supply chains, one that Congresswoman Blunt Rochester has led on. I want to ask you both, Trent, I'll, I'll start with you first. What, you know, help us reflect on what have we learned over the past two years when supply chains have really kind of burst into the open for every American? What have we learned about supply chains and, and the relation to overall competitiveness that we need to, you know, keep remembering and apply going forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the critical things that we've learned and, and we particularly in our work, you know, we mentioned, you mentioned the, the verticals and the horizontals. We've done a lot of the mapping in terms of looking at the value chain of, 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 of different types of manufacturing in those industries, um, intermediary good creation, um, as well as the supply chain linkages. So one of the most important things that we learned was that, uh, uh, you know, supply chains are only, are only as good as their resilience and only as good as your relationship with neighboring countries. And so to the extent that there was a, a lot of uh, uh, focus around you know, the pandemic broke out, mask production, um, um, defibrillator and respirator machine production. Um, it put an emphasis on some items and, and components that perhaps we had a, a majority share of production here or even a small share, but we, we, we realized our interdependency and how strong that interdependency was and that just in time manufacturing and production um, may, may not be serviceable enough, right? And may actually fall down. So I think that before the pandemic, it appeared to me uh, and, and folks that we work with that there was already an arrival at, at sort of bipartisan efforts towards um, increased uh, U.S. competition and efforts to invest within the United States to uh, increase our manufacturing uh, stateside. But I think the pandemic has shown that that needs to be doubled down and there needs to be a prioritization that gets applied to the most essential types of, of items that Americans need. And, um, you know, those types of, of products, goods, services and technologies which will put us at the forefront and enable us to be much more resilient if there is another exogenous type of event or shock to our uh, to our economy, to our country. I think that's one of the biggest things we learned is that we, we can't always rely on that interdependency within the supply chain to always be there. Another key theme you're hitting on, Trent, that, that resilience, you know, overall and then industry specific. Liz, you, I know you spend a lot of time thinking about supply chains. What lessons are you and your colleagues, you know, kind of taking away and applying from the last couple of years? Well, I think there are so many and it's, um, it's really interesting and a little bit gratifying coming from my MIT background to have the entire country, if not world, talking about supply chains. This is, you know, this is now the lens through which we see the economy and it's an important lens. And as Trent said, you know, what we understand now is that, uh, and this has been, you know, for decades and the incentives are there, certainly in this country, companies have been prioritizing efficiency over resilience and they have seen those as a trade-off. And what we understand now is no, in fact, you need efficiency and resilience and that they shouldn't be seen as a trade-off. And the question is, you know, what does, what do individual firms need to do and what are they doing to build that resilience? And then what as a, as a government, as a country, can we do to ensure that resilience? And it's absolutely the case that the pandemic exposed uh, the, uh, the concerns we, we have and the priorities we need to ensure our national and economic security. So from PPE to semiconductors in both, you know, in both cases, we need a capacity domestically to actually produce these things from a national and economic security point of view. And the other thing we've learned, if you're a multinational and you're working in 10 plus countries, uh, the odds are you will hit a, a disruption, a supply chain disruption every 3.7 years. This is, a, I think, a recent McKinsey number. This is uh, here to stay. Disruptions of supply chain uh, will be continuing, whether it's health related pandemics, whether it's climate related, whether it's geopolitically related. And so what does resilience look like? And that's, I think, having um, a really important impact in how we rethink our strategies. One of those important strategies, as Trent pointed out, is a domestic production strategy, which is at the center of the Biden administration's um, priorities. Uh, also, of course, friend shoring, near shoring, those are also um, part of what's going on. But as you'll recall, uh, the president issued one of his first executive orders in February of 2021 was on 
supply chains and looking at uh, the in-depth supply chains of a number of key areas, uh, pharmaceutical API, APIs, critical minerals, semiconductors, and advanced batteries. And that work, um, along with seven other reports that have been done by agencies, it's very, very solid work. If people haven't seen it, I think uh, it really lays out the vulnerabilities for the country. And it's important to say these vulnerabilities have been for, around for a long time. It is not the pandemic that created these vulnerabilities. We could have all had this conversation five plus years ago about our uh, dependence on semiconductors and the risks involved in that. Uh, same thing, I have been uh, deeply involved with our uh, um, transportation logistics supply chains and understanding how we're going to, you know, how, how we're moving, um, you know, unprecedented amounts of, of goods into the country over the last year plus. Our infrastructure has been a problem for a long time. It, the, the pandemic um, and uh, the supply shock, the demand shock have both exposed you know, where the limitations are. And, and frankly, you know, the, the system has responded in a, an extraordinary way, but there are challenges there. So I think we've learned, we've seen where the, uh, the uh, ex exposed the weaknesses, and now we've got, uh, happily, we've got infrastructure funding to try and address them. And importantly, as you mentioned in the Bipartisan Innovation Act, we've called out specifically supply chain uh, resilience program that could help us both look around the corner with a monitoring and anal analysis capability to say, okay, what's the next issue that we should be you know, concerned about? And then also provided funding for us to help uh, strengthen domestic supply chains where we see uh, exposed issues for the country, whether that's that there's only one you know, supplier left in the country, where there's industries that we know we need uh, to shore up, uh, whether there's technologies we feel uh, we should be investing in. I think it's a, it's a very, um, exciting uh, opportunity for us to really get ahead of this. Liz, that provision, uh, the supply chain provision, I should, I should note, as I noted with uh, the Congresswoman, that's something that BPC has been publicly supportive of through our, our C4. And Liz, I'm glad you also drew that connection between uh, resilience that Trent has emphasized and corporate behavior. Uh, BPC has a corporate governance program and we are increasingly looking at those connections between, okay, competitiveness, innovation, at a macro scale, micro scale, and what does that mean, you know, on a corporate governance lens uh, in terms of uh, public policy? Um, for anyone, I think for anyone listening to Trent and Liz, who is either going to school, going back to school, or has college-aged children, it seems clear that logistics management is going to be a, a very good field to enter. Um, Trent, before I, I want to transition, I want to talk about some labor market issues and, and dig in here. Anything uh, you want to add to what Liz has just taken us through? I, I think one of the things, this goes to your point about the logistics. I mean, um, Representative um, Blatt Ronchester made a point about bringing sexy back for STEAM and STEM. The same is true for logistics and operations. I think that this has really brought it to the fore. Um, the second thing is that um, all, I completely agree with a lot of what Liz had said about examination, analysis, and ways to monitor. I think one component we're exploring with, with our clients um, in the official sector is ways to stress test uh, different supply chains. Um, similar to what we experienced during the financial crisis uh, and with the CCAR process for financial institutions, the need to stress operations and credit and balance sheets and so on. Similarly, doing some ideation around what is stressing different types of aspects of supply chain look like um, in order to create that, you know, it's one thing to say you're resilient. It's another thing to actually test it and make sure that it's going to be viable uh, and, and able to uh, to, to be a, a, a serviceable throughout a crisis, whatever it may be, whether it's war, famine, um, uh, uh, other other types of exogenous events. So that's something that we're spending more time thinking about as well. If I could just follow up on that, there's a great case study of Ford Motor Company look stress testing their supply chain, um, and the first point is to say they didn't have full view into the into their supply chain, right? Going down to the third, fourth, and fifth tier, which is the case for a lot of companies, certainly the case in semiconductors. Um, and secondly, that the weakness in the supply chain was in that fourth and fifth tier. It was in the small supplier of the, you know, 10 cent widget. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that we want, uh, you know, all companies to be aware of and, uh, and figure out ways that we can strengthen it, uh, both in the private sector, but also how the public sector can incent that uh, strengthening as well. I want to remind our audience again, you could submit questions uh, using the live chat function in YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag BPC live. 
Liz, I want to ask you about some of your research um, at MIT, uh, and then Trent, get your thoughts on this interaction between technology and labor markets that we heard the Congress Congresswoman highlight. Liz, you chaired the MIT task force uh, on the work of the future, if I had that name correctly. Uh, there was a report issued a couple of years ago. It's excellent work, all the research briefs, the report. I highly encourage everyone to, to go check it out. We will link to it uh, in our follow-up from the event. Liz, that work, I think, if I'm getting my timing right, that the report was first issued in 2020. I think it was later issued as a book uh, that was out either this year or, or last year. You know, take us through a very high level summary of what that uh, task force found, but then also, has anything changed in your view, you know, even in that short amount of time since you released that research? Yeah, great. Well, thank you for the plug for the book. I, you know, will always be appreciative of that. Um, but yes, had this extraordinary, um, effort at MIT, the Task Force on the Work of the Future, which involved 20 plus uh, faculty across five different schools, um, tens and tens of, of, of graduate students, trying to bring together uh, a technology lens and the social science lens, a societal lens, as to what are the um, implications of new technology uh, on work and, and uh, on the workforce. And from a very high level, let me just highlight three of the kind of key findings from that, from that work. And the first point to make, which I think speaks to this competitiveness agenda and the importance of the innovation en engine is that technological change is both uh, simultaneously replacing existing work and creating new work. So it's not eliminating work altogether. You know, when we started that work, there really was, do you remember the robots are coming and there will be no more jobs. That was that was sort of the mantra. We were all afraid for our children and our children's children. You know, we're going to need to, we're either going to be on the you know, beach drinking martinis or whatever it's going to be. We're going to be, you know, destitute. The fact is that we, the, the technology is creating work uh, and creating new jobs as much as it's destroying. Uh, we know that over 60% of the work performed in 2018 had not even been invented um, as of 1940. So, you know, this is what we're seeing kind of the churn uh, all the time. We don't see it perhaps in the day to day, but we do have that churn. And, and that's important. You know, technology is actually critical, which is why the investments in uh, innovation and R&D are so critical to the country's growth. Um, the second point, which I, again, I think is uh, very much um, at the core of the Biden administration's um, priorities, is that what we've seen over the last 40 years is that rising labor productivity has not translated into broad increases in incomes um, across the board, and largely because our labor institutions and policies have just fallen into disrepair, right? Productivity growth and compensation growth have not they diverged essentially in the 1980s, the great divergence, such that the typical worker um, you know, has not benefited, did not benefit, I should say, uh, from that productivity growth. Uh, that you know whether it's technology globalization or our institutions uh, that support workers all of those factors had led to this great divergence and that's something that we're actively trying to address as part of the administration's um, priorities um, and then the third point i will say is that you know as much as technological change feels like it's um happening at rapid pace and it is the you know the pace it, it does seem to be accelerated um the changes are ultimately uh, gradual in nature. Um, you know, when we were out talking to firms, the, the largest impact we would see on firms was not robots. We're not, we weren't frankly seeing um, a ton of robots, but it was more sort of maturing IT systems. It's the internet, it's mobile computing, uh, it's e-commerce. All of those things are really changing the nature of work. Um, and so it's, it's not to say that the pandemic hasn't um, accelerated that it has, that technology has been adopted in, in automation. Um, but it's also uh, something that I think is happening uh, at a pace where it, uh, our labor markets can adjust, our workers can adjust. We have the right, if we have the right education, you know, and uh, career pathways, particularly uh, a focus on the, on the non four year uh, school, you know, career path, uh, there's real opportunities here. And so in terms of what's, you know, what's held, held true, I mean, we at the time at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, you know, we'll just have we'll have mass unemployment for for so long. Actually, you know, that's turned out to be not the case at all, right? We're short workers, uh, not jobs, and uh, and we had predicted that that would be our long-term challenge. Our challenge is not the quantity of jobs; our challenge is the quality of jobs. 
Uh, and so that remains true today. And I think that's a, a big priority for the administration. If we had time, I would ask you both about um, your point about the non four year pathways and some upcoming legislative opportunities on those. Um, Trent, you know, you highlighted the importance of looking at this from an industry level and making industries and companies competitive. Obviously, industries and companies have workers, need workers, that, you know, labor is a big input into productivity and into output. How is your team thinking about this interaction between technology and labor markets and then how that translates into industry competitiveness? Sure. So, I mean, I think one of the thing, ways that we look at this is that technolo technology is here, technology is part of, uh, uh, of these trends. And, and there's, 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 there's no sort of either or about making a decision about whether to deploy technology or not. At the same time, it's, as, as, as the, the Congresswoman and, and Liz have pointed out, it's also not a zero sum game in terms of economic activity, jobs and, and productivity about uh, Skynet going live and uh, you know, joining the resistance with John Connor, as it were, um, for, for, for those of a certain age who remember the Terminator. So it's something where we, we, we look at it holistically to say that specialized tech training is part of this as far as education and, and, and having a, a, a recalibration of the education discussion within the United States. Um, oftentimes, technology limitations correlate with low competitiveness to the extent that OECD and, and, and other large economies uh, are lower on the, the technology deployment phase, um, they're upwards of, of 50 to 60 percent less competitive. So part of what we need to be thinking about is, um, you know, automation could help bring some, some of those manufacturing uh, uh, jobs and, and production back to the United States. But what is the high tech uh, related education and specialized tech training that's required to do that kind of manufacturing? Um, there's a lot of uh, desire, if you look at millennials and Gen Z, along the lines of climate and ESG issues to where, uh, you know, there's much more of a higher adoption rate for say solar panels, right? But when you look at production and expense related to solar panels, the, are, the ones produced here in the United States are upwards of 40 to 50% more expensive than China. And a lot of that has to do with labor costs as well as imported materials. So part of what we've done is by looking at these industries and breaking down the value chain segments uh, and identifying in some areas and aspects like R&D and design, the United States may be very well leading within that value chain. But when it comes to materials or it becomes uh, down to fab uh, as far as manufacturing of, say, microchips, that may be areas where we, we lag and we, there needs to be more investment. That investment can come from explicit um, public-private partnerships, from tax credits, from a whole host of different options. But I think it's really it really emphasizes the joining of where are those different types of investments? Where, sh where should those be prioritized as far as enhancing those value chains? And how does that relate to um, the life cycle of education and or retraining uh, to be able to better suit the labor force to be able to make that pivot? Uh, a lot of these technologies, they're, they're, like I said, they're already here. It's a matter of how can we attune our labor markets more easily and readily to be able to face those types of opportunities and challenges. Thanks, Trent. We've just got a few minutes left. Uh, I want to make sure I ask you both about a point Liz made earlier, and that's this relationship between, you know, national competitiveness, how competitive are our firms and our industries on a global level, and then the link between the micro foundations of competitiveness in our domestic economy. So, you know, President Biden has made competition policy uh, a signature effort, issued an executive order, uh, I believe, last year. Um, I want to ask you both you how there's bipartisan movement in Congress on antitrust, uh, you know, strengthening antitrust uh, law and enforcement. So I want to ask you both to help our audience and, and those who will view this later. How should we think about this relationship between global competitiveness on one hand and then competition policy at home on the other? You know, is, is, are there trade offs there? Are there what are the competing interests there? Liz, I'll start with you because I know you spend a lot of time thinking about this. Yes. Well, again, um, as I said before, our global competitiveness, you know, is driven from, in my mind, from the bottom up. And it, of course, our federal, you know, we set the stage with tax policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy. But when we want to talk about, you know, firm competitiveness, industry competitiveness, where is that coming from? That is coming from, you know, universities, um, a skilled workforce, an effective infrastructure for our businesses, uh, a whole host of other 
uh, pieces that are where regions and regional policy also plays a role. So I think that that's important for us to understand that it's there is no you know one issue uh, that is controlled by the feds or that will make a, you know some sort of uh, difference in terms of understanding our global competitiveness. It's it's a combination of what happens uh, between uh, public and private, between federal and state. Obviously, the feds you know are uh, we are making bets when it when it comes to R and D as as much as uh, people may not want to. Um, acknowledge that, but we are saying, you know what, we think um, AI is important, we think that biotech is important, we think that um, 3D printing and robotics are important, we are, you know, deciding that there are particular types of investments that we think will help our competitiveness and help, you know, help our, uh, our regions uh, as, a, as a whole. When in terms of setting the stage on a competition policy specifically with respect to anti-competitive practices or, or antitrust, I mean, it's clear that the lack of competition, we know lack of competition hurts Americans in multiple ways. It can help, it can raise prices facing consumers. It can hurt workers when there's, if there's fewer employers competing to hire and retain workers, so there's lower wages or less bargaining power. It can um, be, create less resilience as we've seen, I think both in meat processing during the, uh, during the pandemic, as well as currently in infant formula. Um, so, uh, and also I think, you know, less competition can, um, can change sort of the, the calculus vis-a-vis -vis investing in, uh, in innovation and, and how that trickles down to the rest of the economy. So that has been a, a core issue for the administration. Uh, the president did sign an executive order last summer on promoting competition in the American economy. He set up a White House Competition Council. I think it's very important for us to look at our industries um, and understand, you know, are they still uh, promoting the kind of competition we want in the 21st century? And how does that affect, you know, our broader uh, dynamism in our, in our marketplace? As the regional piece, which you've mentioned several times, is another really important um, dimension here, which, you know, we could do a, an entire hour just on, on that. Uh, Trent, curious for your thoughts on this competitiveness competition policy you know we know that in some areas of the economy there's rising concentration we know that in other areas the, the importance of young firms growing firms you know that challenge the incumbents we also hear folks saying you know now now is not a good time to 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 strengthen any trust you know we got to compete with china lots of lots of cross currents here how are you and your team thinking about this especially when you're looking through that lens of in industry competitiveness and leadership yeah so i think you know we, we, we tend to think of it in the sense that um, a more competitive microcosm, whether it's within Silicon Valley, whether it's in New York City, whether it's within Columbus, Ohio, um, that's gonna create a better uh, uh, American economic engine. That's gonna create a more competitive economic engine and industry, more comp competition for labor. I do think that, that, that as, well, as much as there's that entrepreneurial framework and American spirit and competition and markets, there needs to be some big bets that are made within the, the, the federal and public official sector sphere um, to be able to consolidate and create the kind of base and, and scalability for some of these different um, innovative technologies that some of which Liz had mentioned, where there, there's a very a large need for additional support, not just from dollars and investment, but also from, from retooling incentives with respect to uh, education, training, um, and, and those types of aspects, as well as obviously tax tax policy plays a role in that too. I think that you know part of what is is hypercritical is is I think we can be as Americans about um, other countries that compete against us and where we sit. Um, it's important to remember that um, part of the, the, the part of our advancement is failure, right? Company companies being able to fail, companies being able to develop new technologies that. Maybe they're not ready for prime time yet within the consumer marketplace or the industrial marketplace, but it's planting those seeds and, and creating uh, those types of opportunities. I think part of where other countries uh, can get it wrong is that they really try to shore up uh, and, and, and sort of hold up different industries where they aren't really that competitive or they aren't doing anything really innovative. And it's sort of good money after bad and, and setting up generations of, of, of potential labor that may go unused in the future. So. Part of, our, part of what I, I hope to take away is, is that we have a, a vibrant and dynamic economy um, and a framework, uh, legal and otherwise, here in this country, and, and we need to keep pushing it and, and, and keep pushing uh, our young people, 
uh, to, to, to take risks, to, to, to take on new challenges and try to do great things and be bold. Liz, we've got about 30 seconds left. Any final comments or um, thoughts on what Trent has just said? Well, I just, I couldn't say it better. Trent, uh, Trent really hit the uh, nail on the head. Um, I do think we have an extraordinary opportunity right now. As I said earlier, um, when we were discussing things, you know, we've got uh, headwinds right now with inflation, but the fundamentals and the direction we're taking, uh, we're putting the country on a whole new trajectory so that it's not just about starting those companies here, Trent, but scaling them because we can, because we have the technology, because we can leapfrog, uh, we can take back the reins on a lot of this, of these industries that we've lost. Uh, we can innovate our way into strong and resilient supply chains and into uh, climate, you know, energy, um, uh, clean energy, and into all of these areas that I think um, will really um, transform uh, the country over the next uh, several decades. So we're very excited for, for what's ahead. I want to thank both Trent Reasons and Liz Reynolds, as well as Representative Blunt Rochester for their time, uh, their excellent insights, and thanks to our audience for tuning in. Thank you.